You are listening to the REI Mastermind Podcast. Join JD as he chats with industry-leading real estate experts and professionals. We learn from their experience and uncover the strategies to their success that we can implement into our own businesses and we can drive immediate results today. They share their experience and wisdom as we build the foundation to our own success. This is the REI Mastermind Network. We have Jacob Vanderslice with Van West Partners, and uh, he specializes in a couple things, and we're going to jump uh, all over the place here today. I have a feeling, Jake, so it, this is going to be a great conversation, but you really specialize. Your your primary focus is self-directed IRAs, um, but you have some experience in fix and flipping and also self-storage units. And and I, I really want to focus on that today because we frankly haven't had a lot of discussion regarding that. But um, if you want more information, and I always uh, make sure we provide this right up front, uh, Jacob's primary website is vanwestpartners.com. And I'll make sure to have those links in the show notes. And I know you're very active on LinkedIn too. So look for Jacob Vanderslice there. Is there any place else you want to direct people? Uh, those are those are both great. Jacob at Van West Partners is a good email, uh, but but great to connect with you today, JD. And thanks for having us on the show. We appreciate it. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Uh, and and let's uh, spend just a few minutes talking about self directed IRAs because I think this is something that uh, is a bit underserved. And um, to be honest with you, I've talked to local. Um, uh, planners, you know, uh, money planners and retirement planners uh, to try to help with some of this. And when I tell them self-directed IRAs, I usually get kind of a blank stare. And even some of these professionals may not even know what I'm talking about. Well, it's very generous of you to say we specialize in self-directed IRAs. I, I wouldn't quite go that far. We, um, we certainly accept self-directed IRAs as investments into our, our various private real estate investment vehicles. Uh, really, your your main considerations with an IRA, uh, as it relates to investing in real estate, is whether the the entity you're investing in is using leverage at the entity level or the fund level, and there are a few impacts that that leverage will create on the tax side for your retirement account. So it's kind of complicated. We won't go too far into the weeds on it, but. Essentially, whatever leverage the fund or syndication might use that you're investing in, that percentage of the leverage um, as a percentage of the total cost basis is also the percentage of the income tax you'll realize in the IRA account. So, for example, if a property is a uh, million dollars, um, someone's putting $300,000 in an IRA and bringing in a 70% loan to cost loan, 70% of the income to the IRA would be taxable. Because of that leverage component, it's called um, it's basically called UDFI, and that's um, unrelated debt financed income. And most people kind of think about that and, and think to themselves, maybe I shouldn't use my IRA to invest in this vehicle because of that issue. But the benefits of leverage, if used responsibly, I think far outweigh the detriments. And by the time you're enjoying the depreciation along the way and all the benefits that come along with real estate. Your taxable income to your IRA during the whole period is basically negligible. Um, so whether it's a entity that's using leverage or not, self-directed IRAs are a good vehicle to passively get involved in third-party private placement real estate deals. You just have to understand some of the tax implications that uh, that might arise with that leverage component. Sure. Well, yeah, I'm I'm sorry I mislabeled you regarding the uh, the specialization in this. Well, that's okay. No, you're, you you could. We we definitely have an understanding uh, of IRAs. Uh, you were, you were, you didn't mislabel. You were just being very generous. <laughs> okay. Well, let's 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 jump uh, jump around a little bit. You know, I, like I I kind of warned you that I'm especially interested in your uh, take on self on self storage units. This is one of those things that is really uh, well, unless. You running those numbers has to be completely different. A lot of the people, especially when they get into real estate investing for that first time, we're so focused on single family homes that we miss a lot of these other uh, real estate classes that probably should have some of our attention. How did you get into self-storage? 
Well, we got started. I'll touch on self-storage as an asset class in a moment. I'll, I'll briefly tell you our backstory. I got started investing in real estate full-time in about 2006. We started off doing a lot of single family fix and flips all over the country, mainly in Denver, um, a lot of buy, fix and sell, buy, fix and rent, did some development, some residential development um, for sale town owned product around Denver. We got into commercial real estate in 13 and 14 doing adaptive reuse retail projects around town, which is basically converting an old building into a multi-tenant experience based retail like breweries and restaurants. We held on to some of those, we sold off others. And we, get, we did our self-storage deal, uh, our first self-storage deal in 2015. And we like the asset class because it's been historically resistant to recessions and downturns. It's fairly predictable, scalable, repeatable, um, good upside, but with good downside mitigation at the same time. And while self-storage is real estate, it's, it's very operationally intensive. It's a full-on business. And I would liken self-storage most to, to hospitality. And it seems like a stretch, but... In, in hospitality, you have very dynamic revenue streams. Uh, they ebb and flow by the season and even by the weekend if there's a conference in town, right? Hotel rooms are more expensive. Self-storage is similar in that the leases are all month to month. Hospitality is not month to month, but they're short term, obviously. Um, and they change by the season. And you have constant turnover of customers moving in and moving out every day. So it's a, it's a very dynamic revenue stream that you can respond to real time based on supply and demand changes, not only at the facility level, but at the submarket level as well. And the month to month lease is appealing to the customer base because the customers don't feel like they're locked into a long-term obligation. Most of them will stay much longer than they think, but they're still month to month. And it's interesting also on the ownership side, because if you, if you have a, a unit type that say is very, is very full, you can increase rates on that unit type to not only your existing customers, but new customers that move in. And likewise, if you have a unit type that's maybe lighter in occupancy, you can drop rates to, to get to critical mass occupancy in the beginning, raising rates over time. Mm -hmm. So the revenue management is very dynamic. Um, we also like the granularity of the revenue streams. So we're, we're relying on thousands of people to pay us 50 to $200 a month. And the chances that half of those people are going to roll over at the same time is very low. So the downside protection is good. Um, it's the polar opposite of, say, a triple net industrial deal where you might build a warehouse and lease it to Amazon. You can predict your revenue stream out for the entire term of the lease, assuming they pay. And as long as they pay, you're good. If they don't pay, you've got a you know 200,000 foot warehouse. You have to find a new tenant to fill up. Self-storage is the polar opposite. You've got a bunch of tiny revenue streams, small monthly dollars, and uh, very dynamic changes in, in supply and demand based on seasonality, supply ratios, uh, a variety of factors. So it's an interesting asset class and it's, it's very operationally intensive. Sure. Well, could you talk a little bit about like how you run the numbers on a place like this? Like when you're looking at a, a an acquisition, what do you look yeah. for? I'm sure it has to be pretty different. Yeah. The, the first thing we look at are local supply ratios. Self-storage is very local supply sensitive. So we'll track supply ratios in the one, three and five mile trade radius. And if a market's getting oversupplied with new construction, you'll start to see a decline in occupancy and rates because people don't want to drive too far to store their, their goods. And if there's a lot of competition, rates go down. It's very simple supply and demand. So that's the first thing we look at. We also compare historic pricing on given a given facility or facilities in the submarket to compare against our underwriting. So for example, uh, we have a bunch of deals in the upper Midwest where the winters are really extreme. You know all about that in, in Fargo, obviously. So the seasonality and the leasing season in Milwaukee, for example, is very different than the seasonality and leasing season might be in, might be in Florida. So we'll look at all those historic revenue streams from competitors and we'll normalize our revenue assumptions based on the peaks and troughs of, of the demand cycle. And we'll use all those, all those data points to make an acquisition decision. And beyond that, those are all uh, specifically for self-storage, but we look for markets that just have good... Um, good demographics and good real estate nuts and bolts. We don't want markets with a declining population. We typically shy away from states with oppressive tax environments and regulatory environments. Um, but by and large, first and foremost, it's got to be good real estate and it's got to be a, a good, a good sub market to own real estate. in. Sure. So have you found that a, a, a lot of the storage units that you're buying, are they primarily mom and pop 
situations where they're maybe undervaluing the property? How do you, and then on the flip side there, you know, like, unlike real, uh, some other real estate classes, are, are there uh, added values that you can, you can add to increase, increase rents and, and a few other things. Yeah, how do you, how do you turn most, them around? Of, most of our sellers are, we have some, uh, some private equity sellers that just aren't great operators. Maybe their, their rents are below market or their expense loads are above market. They're not efficiently advertising the facility. But for the most part, I would I would certainly agree with saying that most of our sellers are mom and pops. And if we if your facility is 98% occupied and you're a mom and pop, you don't want to poke the bear. You want to keep it full. You get your check every month and your distributions mm-hmm. to your partners. But if you're 98%, it probably means your rates are too low. And believe it or not, in self-storage, you don't want to be too highly occupied. You're ideally your high 80s or low 90s in occupancy. That gives you room on your vacant units to increase prices, to have new customers move in and increase revenue streams. Um, the two types of deals that we're buying right now within our fund entities are we're only buying existing self-storage facilities. We've done development, we've done conversions, but lately we're only sticking to buying existing storage deals. And our two value creation strategies are really buying deals that have low occupancy. And our year one business plan is better marketing, rebranding, and bringing it up to higher occupancy. And the other type of deal we're buying has have higher occupancy, but with below market rents and above market expenses. So our year one business plan on those types of deals will be to get below market customers up to market rates. And in both deal types, we layer in a number of ancillary revenue streams that a number of mom and pop owners don't have. Um, one of those is tenant insurance. And I'm sure when you travel and you rent a car, you decline the the, uh, the car rental insurance because you have coverage on your auto policy or, or your credit card. Um, so we do the same thing. And the margins on those insurance policies are pretty substantial. So we require our customers to present proof of insurance from their homeowner's policy. And if they don't, they have to buy one of our policies. Mm-hmm. So we'll pay our carrier about $2 a month in premiums per unit. And we'll charge our customers between $10 to $15 a month for up to 5,000 bucks in coverage. And that spread may not seem like a lot, but when you amortize that across thousands of units, then you put a cap rate on it. You have a material effect on your on your value of the property, but of course also on your dividend yield that the cash flow is producing. So that's one of the revenue streams we'll layer in. We'll also add in administrative fees, which is a one-time fee when a customer moves in. So getting below market customers up to market rates, getting occupancy increased and layering these ancillary revenue streams in and just better marketing and better customer service are at the core of our, of our value creation strategy on these deals. Sure. Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. I wouldn't have guessed or thought that, that uh, even, even considered the insurance part of it. You yeah. know, that's one of those, but that makes a lot of sense. You know, like a lot of the online self-management uh companies like Cozy, for example, it might be free to landlords, but they're making their money on selling renter's insurance and a few other things. Absolutely. So there has yeah. to be some yeah. money there. The, margin, the margins on these types of insurance policies, car rental insurance, rental, renter's insurance, self-storage, it's uh, they're pretty substantial. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, you talked about a number of things that uh, you can add some value to when it comes to these self-storage units. Um, I, I have to, I, I, I gotta ask the, this question you know we we see these uh storage wars and stuff online um and uh, you're already getting a grin the storage wars and that online how do you handle those people that kind of bail on you i mean more times than not the contents of these and i can understand why it's kind of a volatile situation they're they're basically one step away from from uh, taking those to a thrift store or the dumpster, um, how do you how do you deal with these these units when they've been just well, left abandoned? Well, typically, when we'll make a new acquisition, we'll typically inherit a lot of delinquency from the prior ownership group who just wasn't managing it efficiently. So, the first six months, we'll be cleaning up delinquent tenants, getting getting units uh, uh, back in service that were down from delinquent tenants. But the process is pretty straightforward. So it's very different than multifamily where there are fair housing laws and certain regulations you have to follow state by state. Uh, Self-storage, if you don't pay your bill, you get locked out by the fifth. 
so you can't get into the facility. If you follow some someone through the gate or somehow get in uh, within another 10 days or so, you get an overlock on your, on your self-storage unit, which is a padlock, so you can't get to your stuff. And if more time goes by, you end up having to go through the auction process. And typically, the auctions can be completed within about two months of a uh, customer going delinquent. We try to work with them as much as possible, especially we did during COVID. We did no auctions during COVID. Um, but in any business, you're going to have people who don't pay their bills and you have to get them out and get somebody else in there. Mm-hmm. So the, the process is basically sending them a lien notice or a, I'm sorry, a certified mail stating that you're delinquent on your rent. Then you advertise it in a local publication, just following the regulations. And then you, uh, you hold an auction. It's typically online. Sometimes they're in person, more in person lately as we kind of come out of this. Uh, but obviously the last uh, year plus has been, um, if we did auctions, they were, um, they were, they were online. So people will come and bid on the stuff. And then most of the reason we'll run auctions is to get the unit back in service to a paying customer, not so much to get value for the content. Sometimes the contents are valuable. Um, the rules are typically such that whatever proceeds you get from the auction, uh, first go to, uh, paying the customer's back rent. And after that background is satisfied, if there are excess proceeds, those will go back to the customer. Uh, but again, making money off the auctions is not really the primary objective. It's it's getting the unit back in service with somebody who's going to pay their bills. Yeah. No, I just wanted to, you know, this is kind of a, a silly question, but uh, set expectations. When you see these uh, these auctions, what's the likelihood that they find of anything of real value in there? It's pretty rare. Um I, I know one owner who had a storage treasures show filmed on their site and uh, the show allegedly planted some items in the unit to make it a little more interesting, which big surprise. That's how reality TV works. Um, I would say maybe 15% of our units, maybe 20% actually have some value to them. Um, and the rest of them are just kind of mattresses and blankets and boxes of old dishes where there's just not a lot of value to them. Yeah, it it always amazes me that what people will pay to store. Right? It's yeah that that is you touched on a very deep point there. That is kind of the crux of why the business works. So I've got a storage unit. So we have a, we own an office building in uh, in Denver, and on the second story we renovated it to make our offices, and on the main floor is self storage. So I personally have a unit down there. And in that storage unit, I, I pay our partnership, I think 120 bucks a month. And in the storage unit, I've got my seasonal gear, like my bikes, my skis, my golf clubs, my camping gear. And then I've got a bunch of family heirloom furniture that is special to me, but I don't want it at my house. And I also don't want to get rid of it. Mm-hmm. So in perpetuity, I will pay that 120 bucks to keep that stuff, not in my house, but somewhere else. And also to be able to access my seasonal gear when I need it and just random storage for whatever else. Um, and that's self-storage for you. People uh, look at it as out of sight, out of mind. And, and frankly, most customers probably could have bought new stuff by the time they paid as much rent as they did. Uh, you, you might, we've had some customers, um, obviously we didn't own the facility back then, but we have one guy and a Wisconsin deal who's been a customer there since 1989. Wow. And uh, had the same couple of units and I'm not sure what he's gotten there, but probably could have bought new stuff with the amount of rent he's paid over, uh, over 30 years. Yeah. And he probably yeah. doesn't uh, visit it very often. No, uh, that guy may not, but that, that is one, that's another good point you make too. Um, most of our customers want consistent access to their storage units. A lot of them are small business owners, uh, we have a beverage distributor in Milwaukee, for example, that's got a few units and you open their doors up and you've just got pallets and pallets of of uh, Coke and Sprite and whatever other beverages they're stocking in vending machines. Um, so a lot of them are business owners and they want to get to their stuff pretty often. Uh, some folks just use storage units for seasonal things and they come by two or three times a year to to get what they need and kind of everywhere in between. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So, you know, uh, Going back to the self-directed IRAs, you essentially then help people uh, invest in the, the projects and the acquisitions that you have going on? Yeah. So we, we raise a, a fair amount of private equity and our different real estate funds and syndications. And most of the cash, most of the capital, I should say, that we raise is, is cash. Um, I would say probably 20% of our capital stack is uh, self-directed IRAs. 
And again, they're, they're a good vehicle because most self-directed IRA investors can't touch the money anyway for a long time. Um, it creates cash flow. There's appreciation. And on the percentage of the fund that's not levered, all of those gains and distributions are all tax-free, which is very attractive. Um, so it's a good it's a good vehicle for investing in kind of long term cash flow opportunities with uh, with an upside component. Right, and there's a lot of benefit in in investing with a company that knows what they're doing and has some some track record with it too. Yeah, we we've got 170 million in self storage, and I'd like to think we know what we're doing. But we always say we get uh, less stupid every year. We we every year we learn more of what not to do versus what to do. Um, but we found it's a great asset class, and um, we're we're very fortunate that that's been our focus, especially with all the turmoil. Uh, we have some retail projects here in Denver. Um, some of the stuff I described to you earlier that thankfully all of our tenants made it through, with the exception of one. But those were some really tough months and quarters uh, during the height of this whole thing. You know, restaurants with almost no revenue other than takeout. Right. Thankfully, PPP helped a lot. But self storage performed as an asset class really well uh, during this whole crisis, and historically, it's done that. And the the first two quarters of this year for us and for a lot of other operators have been record quarters, a lot of occupancy growth, revenue growth, and we'll see how long that continues for. But I think a lot of that's pent up demand uh, from folks who just were not mobile, um, you know, during 2020, who are back to moving around the country again, traveling, uh, getting new jobs, uh, really really just life changes or self-storage demand drivers. And obviously people have seen a lot of life changes lately. Sure. As you're, as you're acquiring these, then are you pretty much staying to certain markets or are you across the whole United States? So we're, we're mainly, uh, we've got a, a number of deals here in Denver. We're mainly in the Midwest and Southeast. We've got deals in Florida, um, Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois, North Carolina, Tennessee, Michigan, and Ohio. Those are the, the main states we're operating in. We've got a few deals on deck in the Florida Panhandle that will likely close in Q3 of this year. Another deal on deck in Illinois that's going to be Q3 or Q4. So we, we found the Midwest and Southeast uh, secondary and tertiary markets are really good blends of current cash flow, but with appreciation as well. Um, a lot of the primary markets you might invest in, like major MSAs, downtown locations, you might have the potential for more appreciation because of uh, compressed cap rates, but the cash flow along the way is very light. And we are we are big cash flow and recurring revenue investors. I think if you're focused on recurring revenue and cash flow, the value creation to a degree kind of takes care of itself. The appreciation component rather kind of takes care of itself. So those are the markets we focus in. We we like uh, we like New Mexico. We've looked at a few deals there. Utah is an interesting market. We've just struggled to find any anything that's uh, that's made sense in the last couple of years. Right. So, how have you uh, done with managing these remotely then and getting them turned around? Especially the, that first six months. It sounds like there's a lot of heavy lifting going on at that point. Yeah, management is where the rubber hits the road because so much of our value creation strategy is revenue growth and expense controls. Um, we used to outsource all of our property management to the large national REITs. And we found over time that uh, our interests were to a degree misaligned with theirs. And primarily we found over time that a third party just doesn't care as much as you do because it's your yeah. deal. So we formed our own management platform about three and a half years ago. It's called Clear Home Self Storage. And we self-manage, uh, we have 32 facilities. We self-manage uh, 28 of those 32. And um, really, a lot of the friction comes in the first couple months when you're getting customers kind of retrained on where to make their payments to, uh, rebranding. We'll do some construction on most of these deals we buy, not major construction, but like gate repairs and replacements, maybe seal coat the asphalt, door swaps. Um, so there's, uh, there's quite a bit to do during the transition period, but we typically have everyone kind of on the same page within about three to six months after we buy a property. Uh, we just bought a, a $17 million deal about two weeks ago, and that transition has been relatively smooth, but it's certainly not been without its, uh, its bumps in the road. Right. So, uh, yeah, what you know, you, you, it sounds like you went and developed your own software platform or CRM in order to do this type of management. Are there any other tools that you've uh, incorporated that you found really helpful? 
Yeah, we, we use a few different types of software platforms. Um, the first couple I'll mention are just a uh, third party that we pay for. Uh, software as a service, we use Storage for our um, our revenue management and kind of tracking all of our financials and obviously QuickBooks for um, for our income statements and P&Ls. Uh, we did build our own in-house software program that my partner, Aaron Westfall, who's a software engineer by training, has, has built really over the last five years. And it's basically the MLS of self-storage uh, on the rate side. So his software will crawl all of the top operators' website around the country, websites around the country, and scrape all the asking rate data and then cache it away. So we can go into a given submarket and we can look back sometimes up to five years and see all the historical trace price trends, uh, not only year by year, but uh, season by season. So for example, in Florida, uh, when a hurricane comes through, and the, and the sub-market, the, the hurricane affected, you can see a big increase in rates for about six months and then a drop off, drop off thereafter. So if you're not thinking about that and you're a buyer coming into town, underwriting that snapshot in time, you might pay too much because the rates are so inflated because everyone needs storage after a hurricane. So not only does it help us from an underwriting perspective, it also helps us on the revenue management side. We can pull reports from our competitors real time on what they're asking, for example, on a 10 by 10 climate controlled unit that might be on the second story that's got elevator access. And we can pull a report on all of those unit types and what they're asking for on rates and adjust ours accordingly, whether we're high or low. Mm-hmm. So that's another one of our tools. And we use CoStar, obviously, which is the commercial MLS for acquisitions, other software called Radius, which helps with our underwriting and kind of demographic analysis. So there's quite a few software platforms out there. Most of them we pay for as a third party, but uh, we did we did build one. And that's been a, a valuable addition for our uh, underwriting process and also our, our revenue management. Yeah, I was going to, this kind of leads me to, and, and you probably just answered that, like what are some of the other due diligence items that you go through when you acquire this type of asset class? Well, we, we do we do standard third party reports, like a survey, a phase one, a property condition report. Um, most of that stuff is kind of box checking though. The really important things we look at are historical financials from sellers. And we've had some sellers uh, provide us very, very professional, easy to understand rent rolls and historical p ls mm-hmm. We've had other sellers send us a handwritten notebook on their rent roll and their ledger. And uh, those obviously take a lot of time to get into our system, but kind of everywhere in between. But yeah, the uh, beyond the third party reports like the phase one and survey, understanding their historic performance and what they've been, how they've been operating the facility and how it's performed is really important. And then pitting those trailing assumptions against our forward assumptions, which are revenue growth and occupancy growth, and then layering all that in with our analysis of supply ratios and competitor rates. What's the risk of a competitor getting built across the street? And you can't completely eliminate that risk, but you can analyze zoning to see if the zoning in the submarket allows for new self-storage. Um, you can analyze construction costs to see if somebody does buy land at a certain price and build at a certain price per foot. What's their basis going to be? And will that submarket's rent support a rational yield given that basis? So there's a lot of factors that go into it for sure. Right. Well, I can't, I can't believe we've, we've been on the call here already for half an hour and, and uh, I feel we've, we've only touched the tip of the iceberg on this. I wanted to remind everybody head over to vanwestpartners.com and I'll make sure to have that link in the show notes. Plus uh, a few other links that uh, uh, Jacob was kind enough to send over. Uh, before I let you go, and I, I hate to wrap this up on you, but uh, is there a question that you wished I would have asked you here today? No, I don't. I don't think so. The only um, the only piece of advice I might offer to your listeners is people listen to podcasts and educate themselves on real estate investing. The best way to learn how to invest in real estate is to go do a deal. There's no better way to learn. You can think about it. You can analyze. Um, you can read everything you possibly want, but your, your greatest asset is time and you're going to learn by actually going out and executing. So if you're on the fence about getting into the business, don't think about it too much, find a rational deal, protect your downside and and pull the trigger and, and see what happens. Well, with that, I think I'm going to let that ring into everybody's ears because I can't agree more. So thank you, Jacob. This has been a great conversation and I hope you're, you're always welcome back. JD, thanks for having us today. I enjoyed it. We really appreciate it. 
This has been the REI Mastermind Network. You can already tell that we've made some changes and a few more are on the way. If you are interested in what we have planned, head over to patreon.com slash REI Mastermind and support the show today. Financial contributions are always appreciated along with a like, share, and review. It really helps us grow and reach more people with this valuable information. See you next time and tell a friend.